Let's talk about South Carolina. Um, you, you talked in your State of the State address uh, about a lot of things, but I think one of the things that jumped out for a lot of people was a $1.26 billion investment in roads. Right. I, I think a lot of people are like, well, we're raising the gas tax, we're doing all this, and I don't notice a difference. What is this yeah. going to do? Well, it takes a long time. That That's when, when um that that money, of course, is is coming in. It, it goes up incrementally. I think over five or six years, but that money's coming in. But we've had some. We've had a big surplus this year as well, because we didn't shut down with the pandemic as they did in a lot of other states. We were. I think we were. We had a team. We analyzed everything, and instead of trying to figure out what's essential and what's not, all that sort of stuff, we determine which sorts of activities or jobs or pl places where you'd have a lot of face-to-face, -face so we knew that if, if you're up close, that that's the best place for it to spread. So we, we ended up putting limitations there for as short a period as we could and then remove them as quickly as we could, but everything else stayed open. <laughs> to that, our economy continued to grow. In fact, a lot of people, a lot of businesses, the uh, home builders, uh, some manufacturers being, they had the best years they had uh, prior to that time. Uh, so we, we, and we didn't spend money. We froze a lot of spending, spending at the universities, and we, as the CARES money would come in, instead of spending it on things, we put it back into the unemployment trust fund, which is when you're unemployed, that's where you get your money from. And if it runs out, what happens, you have to raise taxes on all the businesses. So we were, we were our group was very careful, and we, we kept refilling that as we went along. So when the pandemic, uh, after it was eased up after the first year or so, we were as full in that fund as we were when we began. We had money in the rainy day fund. We were, in essence, we didn't shut down. We stayed open. Uh, we did the things that were necessary instead of presuming that, a, as a lot of other governors did and, and people, instead of presuming that everything must be shut down completely until the virus goes away, uh, we, our presumption was we don't want to shut anything down unless we can prove, if we had to, to a court, that that is where the virus is going to stay and our putting a limit on it for whatever time, for whatever extent, will have an impact. And that's what we went by. A lot of other states did, and those states that did that, most of which are Republican, by the way, virtually all of them, did a lot better than those that, where the climate is colder, mainly in the north and some out, out west. Uh, we did a lot better. They are digging out, and we are blasting out. We just try to use common sense. But, so so here, comes, here comes this money, and what we are determined to do is to spend it on things that are produce prosperity for generations to come. There are a lot of things that we like to do with, with uh, maintenance and a whole lot of other things, but we, we got to put this, this is big money, and we're not going to have this happen again, probably, uh, and about the children going to be paying this back. There's no such thing as free money. But if we put it in the right things, like broadband, like highways, roads, bridges, all of that, if we do those, those kind of infrastructure things, water and sewer out in the rural areas, that broadband is, is real important, out in the, particularly out in the rural areas. If we do all those things, we'll have built an economic platform or a base that we can really grow on. The way I look at things is there are three parts to our prosperity. That's the economy, the economic development, the environment, and education. We've got a beautiful environment. I was just at a beach advocates meeting uh, off John's Island on uh, Kiowa. I tell you, to drive across John's Island and go under all those live oaks and all that and see the moss. Sure. I mean, you just can't find that everywhere. And I fly around the state some low enough to see things. And th this, this state is, is uh, well, when the explorers were coming here in the 15, 16, 1400s, they were going back to their sovereigns in Portugal, Spain, and England, and saying this place that today we call South Carolina is the most lush, beautiful, prosperous place in the New World. That's what they were saying about us. And all that's still out there. So what we have to do is protect and preserve that for future generations, but at the same time, we, we have to grow. We have to have infrastructure. 
we got all kind of businesses all around the world that want to come here because they like the way our people act, the way they show up for work, the way that they, they like their traditions, they like their customs, but we got to educate them. Uh, but what is that, that $1.26 billion <clears throat> when we talk about our roads? Um, uh, is, it, is, is it going to be enough so that the only way people know coming down 77 that they got into South Carolina is that they see the sun? Because right now, they know they hit South Carolina by the bumps. Yeah, well, the loud road. We, we used to be ahead, but now, now we're behind of, of some other states. But uh, I have proposed putting $360 million into a stretch between Columbia and Charleston to widen that. Uh, we want to widen 385. We want to build I-73. We want to put some money into I-77. Uh, unfortunately, we have a little quick one. Sir, that money go quick. Oh yeah, well it, it it'll it'll be uh, it'll be targeted quickly, but it takes a while to to build a highway. Uh, now Christie Hall and the, our fabulous uh, Department of Transportation and the commissioners have a, a ten year plan that we're we're now ready to jump ahead about six years with all this money that, that we have, both from our our careful handling of the virus, which resulted in. Uh, I think, well, we've got about a $3 billion on about, normally about a $9 billion state fund money. We have a $3 billion surplus that we could be able to spend just because we, just because we did it, uh, did it the right way. We were smart. But if we can get those, if we can get those things done, it'll make a enormous difference for the future. Now, you always have to keep doing it. You can't, you don't ever get finished. But how people know they're in South Carolina, you know how they tell me they know? People, sometimes they're joking, but it's always some seriousness. And they say, I can tell when I'm in South Carolina because if I go to buy some gas and I'm paying a bill or buying something at a restaurant, uh, the, the, the cashier will call me honey, sweetie, darling, and dear. And I know that I'm in South Carolina. <laughs> must be because it happens all over the place. Y'all go home and, and on your way stop someplace, and if they don't, don't call you that, call me up. You talk about... Uh Two years into it now. Um, is there anything about any of it that you regret? I think we do. I call the the old carpenter's room. Yeah, Brad, stop for a second, real quick. I'll take sure. some audio issue here. I just started. Now you're getting interference. One of your batteries is dying. Yeah, we wore it out earlier. Yeah, I know you wore it out earlier. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. I could it. sit and listen to that all day. Well, I tell you what y'all do. Go, uh, where is that thing? There's a trailer. It's got Les Riley in it and Rolex Roads. And they had Rolex Roads when they went to his house. He had 260 Rolex, Rolex, Rolex. watches. Oh, and uh, Barry <laughs> Foy, there was one we caught. Keep him, keep we got a tip. Who gave him the nickname? What if it's I think they gave them to each other. Oh, did they? Oh, these, these were their own? Yeah, yeah. Hey, go see the boss. That was Bob the boss. But we got a tip. We put out, we, we were looking for a, a fella. Couldn't find him. There you go. There you go. Perfect. So, um, crime, we had given Crime Stoppers a, a lot of money yeah. uh, when we seized a lot of it. We gave the Crime Stoppers the Criminal Justice Academy and SLED the, the cash. Right. But anyway, so Crime Stoppers put out a $10,000 reward for anybody turning in this list of people. And sure enough, somebody turned in, I don't know if it was Rolex or, or Road. Anyway, they turned in one of them and said he'd be getting off such and such a plane at LaGuardia Airport on approximately this time of day. And so they went up there, and sure enough, here came a man that matched the description. He had on a full-length mink coat walking through LaGuardia Airport. Of course, he, I mean, he had all kind of fancy yeah. jewelry and stuff. Accoutrement. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> Pierre, all right, that's it. But uh, that's, how we, that's how we got here. All right, Brad, we're good. Okay, uh, let's go back to it. Um, is, is there anything about your handling of the pandemic that you regret? No, because we took a very careful approach. We didn't jump the gun. We had telephone conferences. The, excuse me, the Republican governors had telephone conferences every week. There, there would always be eight or nine of us on there. And President Trump would have meetings just about every week, Zoom meetings, where he and the Vice President and Dr. Burks and often Dr. Fauci and 
uh, uh, Mr. Redmond, I think his name, all of them are right there to, to answer questions. So all the people, all of us in my office, we, we watch that, listen, talk, and, and make our, our plans based on what we, we thought was the, the best thing to do. But we put together a group called Accelerate SC. Mm -hmm. Had about 30 members. They were from hospitals, from academia, <clears throat> had lawyers, teachers, uh, farmers, uh, Commissioner Weathers w was on, joined to several legislators, but <coughs> not counting the government people, there's about 30 people. And the restaurants, uh, hotels, all of that, Dwayne Parrish from PRT. And we, we, just, we as again, use the carpenter's rule, measure twice, cut once. If we do this, will this do it or should we go farther? So we think that'll do it. So. Don't go any farther than that. And it, it turned out that was the right approach. But that was a collaborative approach. We didn't just think up, this is what we're gonna do. We, we had to work our way through it, but it, as, as history has shown, the, the states that use that kind of approach are, are booming, are taking off. We had some businesses and segments that did better, uh, have done better in those years than, than ever before. Now we got a lot of sick people, we know that. <clears throat> but right now we, we know we know how to handle it. Um, these mandates are, are not popular. Uh, they they're not um, they're causing more disruption, I believe, than they're worth. That's why we've challenged them. Those that the Biden administration has put out, and so far we've we've won. The courts have decided with us. But uh, we take the approach: if you give the people the information. And sometimes it's hard to get the facts. But once you get the facts, it's pretty easy to make the decision. But you give the, give the parents the decisions, give the people give the, the facts, and most of the times uh, they will, uh, they'll make the, the, the right decision. And about the going to schools and masks and vaccines and all that sort of stuff, there's a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of, a lot of conversation about that kind of thing. And I'm for open schools getting them in there, and there's some schools that are doing better than others have, they're doing it a, a better way, but we gotta keep them, and we're gonna really have some consequences from the children that were not able to go to school. Well, you but, uh, bring up schools. Yeah, but let, let me mention, there was one, one, one cute thing. Somebody was, was uh, in one of these uh, arguments that some of them were having, was saying, well, we know what's better uh, than you do, parent, for your child. We know, we've studied it, we know better. And this man said, okay, well, tell me their names. Those kind of things, you just, just let that settle on you for a little while and you realize that when you listen to the people, listen to the people and get the, get the facts from the experts and from everyone that is willing to provide information, sort it all out, you make good decisions. And I think that's what we did as a state. Speaking of schools, uh, since I moved here, lawmakers have told me the, the funding mechanism for schools in South Carolina is broken. It's complicated and it, it's not benefiting our kids in the end. You talk about that in your state of the state. Right. Is that too big of a hill to climb to try and undo <laughs> that now? Listen. People have been talking about it for decades. Yeah, those are the best kind of hills to climb. Uh, they say there's no power in a small idea. Uh, I think uh, uh, Coach um, up at Clemson, what's his name? Dabo. Dabo Sweeney, yeah, he's terrific. He says, go big or go home. Well, I, I think that's a good attitude. And, and when you consider the fact that South Carolina is a state of 5.2 million people, we've been here since 1670. I'm the 117th governor of South Carolina. I think some of the states are on their 42nd or their 35th governor or something like that. I mean, we got a deep history of figuring things out. But we've been through everything, and when you, if, if I think is, is in government or, or other, a lot of other leadership positions, if you just tell, tell the people this, this is what can be done, and, and this is the way that we think we can do it, it doesn't matter how big it is, everybody wants their children to be educated. And that's a fact. Nobody wants their children not to have a good education. I mean, that's, uh, that's ground zero. That's what everybody wants. So the question is, how do we get it to them? I think we have to start early. Uh, that's why I'm asking for more money. For We now have it, have it uh, where every child that's in poverty can go to 4K kindergarten in South Carolina, either in public schools or through, through first steps. 
uh, we want to raise the teacher pay. I've asked for it. I've gotten it one time. We need, we need to do it again. Uh, we need to have the best schools in the country, and part of that is to have school choice. This school might not be the best for that child. Uh, they never are. One size can't possibly fit all. We see that from the rules from the federal government about these mandates that are unconstitutional. The states never gave the federal government the power to issue rules on health mandates. That's why it's never been done before. That's why the courts are throwing them out. Same principle applies to the parents and their children. The, the, the local people know, the parents know what their children need. The people in our state know what we need better than, we, the people in Arizona, they don't have any water in Arizona. We, we have plenty of water here. Some states have mountains, some states have deserts, some states have water, some are based on agriculture, some are based on uh, Silicon Valley, all kind of different things. One size does not fit all. Either the national government telling the states, and the states were the ones that created the national government, gave it limited power, which has been encroached upon over, over the years. But likewise, it's the parents that ought to be the first judge on what is best for their child. So we're trying to, and we know that they need to get, to, they need to get started learning at an earlier and early age. So now we've got, we've got it covered, we believe. We know the, the structure is there, the money's there for 4K kindergarten. We probably want to go below that at some point in some places. But um, all kinds of school choices, meeting street school with, uh, with uh, Mr. Is Nadala. that the answer to the funding, the, the uh, choice? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, what we've done, and, and you, as you started off, there's something like 37 different uh, laws that in one way or another touch on school funding. I know very few people that can give you a quick answer on how, how all that works. <clears throat> it doesn't make sense. So what, what I've proposed after input from a lot of people is that we work it on a, a very simple system that for every 11.7 students, wherever they are, then that we will provide, I think it's $66,000 for a teacher. Now that is, that, that would be an average and that includes benefits. But essentially we're trying to have the money follow the child. If the parents want to go to that school, the money follow them there. If they want to go to that school, follow them there. And it might be their job to get them to that school. But the, the parents have to have the choice. If, if, if the school that they are zoned for or that, um, if there's some reason they'd rather go somewhere else, then they ought to have the opportunity to do that. But this this pro, this proposal that I've made, I say I, we, studied this thing with a lot of other people. We think that'll simplify it and make it better. You know, there are a lot of, lot of uh, so what that means is we'd be providing the money for the teachers. Now, a lot of the money in the schools comes from the counties the, through the property mm -hmm. tax. You see it on your, and if they want to spend that money on going to conferences and having 99 uh, administrators instead of just a handful. You know, a lot of these schools are way top heavy. If they want to spend that money on that, then that'll be between them and the people paying those taxes. And I think the people paying those taxes will say no. What I'm going to concentrate on, and I know what the parents, and I think most teachers I talk to, all, they want the money to go to the classroom. We want to have the very best teachers in a clean, safe place. We got mental health counselors, we've, we've gotten that done. The money's available for them. The money's available for a law enforcement officer in every school. If it's clean and safe with a real good teacher and money is not wasted on unnecessary overhead, then we'll be able to educate some children. And we have something in our state they don't have anywhere else, and that is the best technical college system in the United States. Wilbur Ross was uh, President Trump's Secretary of Commerce He'd been to Charleston a number of times making speeches. And he, he has said on the record that South Carolina has the best technical college system in the world. We started it back in the 50s, I think, as a trade school. It has developed. We've got 16 of them. A couple of them need a little bit of help, but they're all there. We have that, that basic structure there. And so what I propose for the legislature, we did this with, I think, about $27 million last year that I had to okay myself. <clears throat> we provided scholarships to students who, who didn't have the money for high demand jobs. 
and how do you define high, high demand? It's what the businesses and industries are calling into the technical college system, say, we need this, we need that. It's, it's not for everybody that wants to just go to technical college. And I mean, you can get a real education at our technical college, which is a part of the higher education system in South Carolina. But I've asked for 142 million from the, the budget that the legislature is considering now, or will be soon, to go for those high demand jobs. And I wish I had the list of what we produced before, but it's truck drivers, HVAC technicians, emergency room technicians, aeronautical technicians. How important truck drivers are right now? Oh yeah, Here, the story in, the, in my state of the state, there was a, a young uh, couple, or, or friends, uh, and they were working, they were, had started one of the technical colleges, but because of the pandemic, they, they had to go virtual for a while, and he couldn't learn that, or they were learning virtually. So they went out and went to work, and I think one of them was making 14 or $16 an hour, and the other was making a little bit more than that. Well, then this program that I described opened up, and they went in and got their commercial uh, driver's license to drive trucks. Before, and I can't remember how many months or weeks it took, but it wasn't long. And they, they, before they walked out with that certificate, they had a job with a big trucking company paying between the two of them $140,000 a year. And when I made that statement in the state of the state, somebody told me uh, the next day, they said, well, actually, they're making more than that now. They're moving all up. Now, that, that's a life-changing thing. These companies want to hire South Carolinians, BMW, Volvo, all those big names, and there are many more. They want to, there's something about the people of South Carolina that they like, they can depend on. They call us a handshake state. I've said to the chairman of BMW, he said, you can't depend on somebody's word somewhere else. He said, no. He said, South Carolina, across the board, when somebody gives you their word, they keep it. And that translates into loyalty, that translates into dependability. It translates into what um, Mark Clark, General Mark Clark, his patriotism. He said there's more per square inch in South Carolina than anywhere. We got all this going for us, but we have to have the roads, the bridges, water, and sewer. And we've got this money. We got to, we got to get broadband out there, and we're going to have to teach some people how to use it and probably have to provide some tablets. But there's a lot of room for volunteer space in there as well, but if we take this opportunity, we don't waste money, and we're smart, and we do it like we approached the virus. That is to think it through, see what we want to do, be sure it's gonna work, and then implement it. If, if we do that, we've got a chance in our state to really take a big jump forward. I could end it there, but I did wanna hit just real quickly uh, law enforcement, because uh, there were some uh, comments from Democrats right after the state of the state about the slick budget's already bloated, and the governor wants to put more money to it. When you hear stuff like that, and then you hear, you look at stats like 50% of the, the, the people who go to the state law enforcement academy wash out before they even get to that job. Where, where, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that <clears throat> statistic, but I know that I think we have the best law enforcement in our state in, in the country as a U.S. attorney and then for four years with Reagan and eight years as a attorney general. And I've been practicing law until I got this job, practicing law since 74 after getting back from Washington, either part-time or full-time. I've met a lot of law enforcement people and they've worked, on, uh, they've worked with them a lot. But the Law Enforcement Coordinating Committee under that President Reagan had us set up where we got everybody together to communicate, collaborate, and cooperate. I am convinced there's no better people in law enforcement, our first responders, uh, the firefighters, all those, they're just, they are exceptional at, and they ain't scared of a thing. And, but we, we need them, we need to train them, and I, 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 need, to I them. need to pay them. Listen, you get up and put on a tie and come sit in this nice place and do an interview, they get up and put on a bulletproof vest that'll stop a pistol but not a rifle. Some of them have to wear an extra one that'll stop a rifle, but of course it only goes right over and the some heart. some of them have to work a second job. And some of them have to work a second job. Do you know when there's a thing that they do, I just learned about this for a few years, when they, <clears throat> you're out on a, a, a highway in the early morning, uh, black dark, 
and there's, you get a report about some vehicle and you pull up in this dark and uh, they roll down the window and smoke comes out and all that sort of stuff. What our law officers do is as they walk by, they will tap on the rear uh, tail light with the finger before they go up there. And why do they do that? DNA put, put their fingerprints, some, put some DNA so if they are dead, then we'll still be able to know that that was the call that people in. Now that's the kind of environment they work in. I mean, I've got enormous respect for those people, but we have to, we, we have the people, but we have to be sure to train them because the, the, one of the main, possibly the main obligation of any government is to keep the people safe so they can do their things. Whether they want to go into music or agriculture or business or stay home or whatever it is they want to do, they got to be safe. If you're not safe, then you, you can't do it. You can't go out at night. You worry, worry about leaving your, your children alone or you worry about leaving your dog alone. I mean, we got to be safe. So I, I'm 100% I'm behind law enforcement in, in general, but particularly in South Carolina because I know how good they are. We've had some problems here and there. Everybody has problems. But it is our law enforcement is great, but we got to pay them more. We got to pay the teachers more. Those, those are two groups that we just we must pay more because they are vital to our success.